in this video we're going to look at periodic trends related to donation or acceptance of electrons by an atom, specifically ionization energy and electron affinity. And these properties are very important not just for atoms but also for molecules. Anytime, for example, current flows, anytime a material conducts electricity, electrons are hopping from one atom or molecule to another. So ionization and electron acceptance are important properties happening in those substances. So first let's take a look at ionization energy. Ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from a neutral atom in the gas phase. And those details are actually important. Gas phase, neutral atom on the reactant side. On the product side we have the ejected electron, which is represented as E minus, and we have A plus, the cation corresponding to the neutral atom on the left hand side, and it's a plus one cation since we've lost one electron. The ionization energy here is called IE1 because this is the first electron lost from the neutral atom, and this is universally an endothermic process. Energy input is required, so IE1 is positive. We can also think about starting from A plus in the gas phase and losing a second electron. The energy associated with that is called IE2. Losing a third electron going from A2 plus to A3 plus is associated with IE3, so on and so on and so forth. Now, periodic trends in ionization energy. How do they change as we move across the periodic table? Down a group, ionization energy decreases, gets less endothermic is another way to put it. And left to right across the period, ionization energy increases, becomes more endothermic. And we'll understand the reasons why here in a second on the next slide, but one thing to note is that this is a trend that is the opposite of atomic radii, which increase moving down a group and decrease moving left to right. The fact that this is reversed with respect to atomic radius is not a coincidence. They're both driven by the same underlying phenomena. Let's take a look now at the periodic trends on a graph of ionization energy as a function of atomic number. We can see, for example, the trend moving down a group if we look at the noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. Ionization energy is decreasing, becoming less endothermic as we move down the group. But within each period, moving for example from lithium to neon in the second period, ionization energy increases as we move from left to right across the periodic table. What's going on here? Well, the way to understand this, as well as atomic radius, is to think back to effective nuclear charge. And something I don't think we've pointed out yet that's very important to understand is that Effective nuclear charge follows exactly the trend you see on this graph. It increases as we move left to right across a period because we're adding protons to the nucleus and maintaining the same core. So shielding does not have a profound impact as we move left to right. It increases a little bit, but not profoundly. Not as much as the plus one charge we get from each proton added to the nucleus. So effective nuclear charge increases left to right. And it decreases moving down a group because the valence shell gets farther from the nucleus. So the farther valence shell with more core shells between the valence shell and the nucleus feels less effective nuclear charge. Ionization energy is purely driven by that effective nuclear charge if we're looking at the first ionization energy of the elements. As the effective nuclear charge increases, the atom has a harder time giving away electrons in the valence shell. That electron being donated or ejected or given away has a harder time doing so. A greater energy input is required when we're talking about high Z effective. On the flip side, for example, as we move down a group and the effective nuclear charge goes down, it becomes easier to remove an electron from the valence shell. In other words, less energy input is required, the ionization energy is lower. So this trend is driven entirely by Z effective, and you can almost think of this graph conceptually as a kind of plot of Z effective as a function of atomic number.
There are a few ripples into it that we won't get into here. For example, nitrogen versus oxygen, phosphorus versus sulfur. There are interesting reasons for those exceptions, which we won't get into here. And I'll make my usual caveat that the transition metals are kind of in a league of their own, which with very little change in ionization energy as we, we move across the transition series. We can also observe some interesting patterns if we look at the later ionization energies and how those change as a function of atomic number. For example, check out the table on this slide where we have the successive ionization energies as we remove one, two, three, four, five, etc. electrons from the atom to generate cations eventually with very high positive charge. The first thing to notice is that each ionization energy is greater than the last. It's harder to remove an electron from a plus one cation than a neutral atom from a plus two, then a plus one, and, and on and on, and so on and so forth. But even on top of that, we can notice something interesting about these numbers if we pay really close attention to the differences in ionization energies from one electron to the next. There's a big jump in ionization energy between two of these values for each element. So for example, for potassium, this happens between IE1 and IE2. For calcium, between IE2 and IE3. For scandium and gallium, between IE3 and IE4. And for germanium, between IE4 and IE5. What's going on with this? Why do we observe these large jumps in ionization energy across these red boundaries that I've drawn here? The key is to appreciate the difference between the valence electrons and the core electrons. And to realize that as soon as we empty the valence shell, removing a core electron becomes extraordinarily difficult and ionization energy becomes very high. So consider germanium, for example. Germanium has four valence electrons and a core containing many more than four valence electrons, but we'll just represent those using a couple of dots and a purple blob there. The first three ionization energies are associated with removal of the first three electrons in the valence shell. So the plus three cation for germanium looks something like this, with one valence electron left and the core still completely intact. When I remove that last valence electron, that's IE4. And now I'm in a situation where the germanium four plus cation has only core electrons remaining. Removing one of those core electrons, which are all very close to the nucleus now, very, very tightly held, is going to leave me with something with a partially unfilled core. And this is associated with a very high ionization energy. And indeed, we see a very large jump from IE4 to IE5 because at IE5, I am removing a core electron from the germanium atom. I have no valence electrons left. And beyond that, the data is not even available, but we would expect these ionization energies to remain ridiculously high as we would continue to remove core electrons. In this practice problem, we're asked to rank the ionization energies listed here. The first ionization energy of aluminum, the first ionization energy of thallium, the second ionization energy of sodium, and the third ionization energy of aluminum. And as we did in the atomic radius context, let's orient ourselves by finding these elements on the periodic table first. So sodium is in group one, and aluminum and thallium are both in group 13. Now let's overlay the periodic trends in ionization energy that we've seen. IE1 is going to increase as we move left to right across the periodic table and will decrease as we move from the top to the bottom of a group. So aluminum's first ionization energy, just as a point of interest, should be higher than the first ionization energy of sodium and higher than the first ionization energy of thallium, just in case that's relevant. Now, what else can we notice about this? Well, we're interested in both first ionization energies and subsequent ionization energies. So what can we say about, for example, IE1 of aluminum versus IE3 of aluminum? Well, for any element, the third ionization energy is going to be greater than the second, which will be greater than the first. And this is because of increasing effective nuclear charge felt by the remaining electrons as I continue to remove electrons from the atom, give the ion more and more overall positive charge. The other important, important point here concerns IE2 of sodium. Sodium is in group one. So after I've removed one electron, my valence shell is empty. The next electron that comes out will have to be a core electron in the Na plus 
cation. And so IE2 is associated with removing a core electron from sodium. So that's going to make this the highest ionization energy overall, IE2. So we can put this whole discussion together and realize that the smallest ionization energy will be IE1 of thallium. The first ionization energy of thallium, it's at the bottom of group 13, farthest to the right and farthest down, and it's a first ionization energy, which is easy relative to IE2 and IE3. Next will be the first ionization energy of aluminum, which is further up group 13, so that electron in aluminum is a little bit harder to remove. Next, we'll have IE3 of aluminum, since it's harder to remove an electron from Al2+, plus to make Al3+, plus, than it is to remove an electron from neutral aluminum to make Al1+. Plus. And then finally, because all three of these that we've listed so far involve removing valence electrons, but the second ionization and energy of Na is associated with removing a core electron, IE2 for sodium will be much higher than the other three because we're removing, again, a core electron right there. Rather than thinking about ripping an electron out of the atom to form a cation, we can also think about giving an electron to the atom to make it an anion. And the process of giving a neutral atom in the gas phase a free electron to form an anion A- minus is associated with an energy called the electron affinity, the energy absorbed or released when an electron is added to a neutral atom in the gas phase. That gained electron is listed on the reactant side and the associated energy is abbreviated Ea. Now interestingly this is usually exothermic because the free electron is unstable outside of the atom and relatively stable inside of the atom. Usually there are exceptions to this that we'll dig into but for many elements on the periodic table electron affinity is exothermic and it's commonly listed as a positive value even though it is an exothermic process. This can get a little bit confusing, so I tend to use the terms more and less exothermic in discussing periodic trends associated with electron affinity. So for example, electron affinity becomes less exothermic as we move down a group, with the most exothermic at the top, the least exothermic at the bottom. And electron affinity becomes more exothermic as we move left to right across a period with the least Alexo exothermic on the left and the most exothermic on the right. So the most exothermic elements when it comes to ex electron affinity are in the top right of the periodic table, fluorine, and the least are in the bottom left of the periodic table, cesium. So here are the trends laid out on the periodic table. If we're thinking about exothermic, meaning a negative value, Roughly speaking, we're getting more negative as we move left to right, although there are exceptions. Group 15 is a particularly notable exception, and the noble gases are all over the place because they have completely full valence shells. Generally, though, we get a less negative value moving down each group, and you can see that playing out, for example, in group 1 here. This is all like ionization energy driven by the effective nuclear charge. The greater that is, the more exothermic or the more negative the electron affinity will be. And this is because that high effective nuclear charge attracts electrons strongly in the atom. And so Z effective is a measure of the propensity of the atom to accept electrons and the energy released as that electron is accepted by the atom. This is all I'll say about electron affinity for the time being. If you're interested in these exceptions, I'll leave these as kind of a cliffhanger and link out to some videos that explore the exceptions to the electron affinity trend in more detail. We won't dive into them here, but they're interesting and can be readily explained by orbital energy diagrams for these elements.